Hello, Monetization Nation. In the last episode with Rio Chiba, we discussed how to increase organic traffic by creating a product that markets itself. In today's episode, we're going to discuss three shifts impacting content marketing and how we can leverage them to grow our businesses. Artificial intelligence, user-generated content, and credibility marketing. Rio also shares one tip about how to organize a content team. Let's go into uh, artificial intelligence. Um, how is artificial intelligence influencing content marketing? Yeah, so one thing that uh, is really a true tectonic shift that marketers are just starting to implement uh, and discover tools around is um, more advanced text generation systems um, and more advanced, you know, anything generation systems. I think. Most marketers are familiar with how easy it is to make a deep fake or, um, you know, even use a tool like Descript to uh, create audio content that's completely synthesized using somebody's voice. And so there are text versions of that kind of AI where the systems can create very human sounding AI generated text. And so this has really massive implications for marketers because it means that instead of paying somebody to write the content, you can have AI assistants to help you write whole articles. Um, and it can get a little dangerous, obviously, because uh, in the hands of the wrong people, you know, you can easily create lots and lots of um, spammy content. And so, um, you know, that's that's sort of one end of the impact of the shift. But the other end is that these kinds of AI enabled text generation tools are going to be um, start to show up in all sorts of places that marketers are familiar with in their tool sets. It's going to be just a part of the content creation experience, just like how everybody's used to using spell check, um, even though that used to be a brand new technology, everybody sort of takes it for granted today. So how would you use this AI tool? Would you go into it and say, I want an article that kind of covers these four or five bullet points, go create it? Essentially, that's what it can do. And that's sort of the magical thing about it. Um, really, what it's going to result in is a commodification of basic content. It's really going to drive the price of creating um, rudimentary content down to zero. And it's going to put more emphasis for marketers on being able to create content that stands out from the rest of the pack using things that we mentioned earlier, that credibility marketing, finding opportunities to leverage your businesses unique abilities to uh, get people to trust what you're creating more and so the the ai is going to help write the content but um you know people's hours are going to be spent figuring out okay how can i take this to the next level so to speak with unique data or more trustworthy sources or a um, better design tell me about your experience working with user-generated content and maybe share some advice and stories with us. Yeah, user-generated content is oftentimes a surprise for people that I've worked with. They don't realize how much their customers are talking behind the scenes about what they are building or what they are selling. Um, and it can be a gold mine for people just to uh, identify and repurpose that for their own marketing channels. and. So my previous company, Tint, specialized in finding that content on social media, getting the rights to it. So asking them if uh, you can reuse that and then leveraging that on your website or uh, in your print or any kind of marketing channel. But um, in terms of being able to uh, take advantage of that, I think the first step is figuring out where your audience lives and then setting up some searches and alerts to watch when people uh, bring your brand up in conversation um, and starting a conversation from there. So then you engage them in the conversation and you ask if you can utilize their content or work with them to produce additional content to be used in marketing channels? Definitely. I think that uh, if people are posting about it, they're either typically evangelists or they're having a very negative uh, experience um, and really it can benefit your business both ways. And we've used that in our business. Actually, we subscribe to 
multiple Slack groups um, where content marketers and SEOs hang out. We've set up alerts to listen to keywords for alternatives and ourselves. When people mention uh, us and they mention they're having a great experience, we'll direct message them and ask them to have uh, to set up a call with us so we can learn more about their experience. And then we'll turn that call into a testimonial video or a customer story. And so that, that allows us to have a, a, a specific process in place to turn those conversations into marketing assets that feed into the credibility of our brand. So what are the best strategies or tools you recommend to be able to do that in practice? Yeah, in practice, uh, we've just been using um, Slack and also uh, we have um, one of our teammates who blocks out specifically 30 minutes of their day every morning to uh, come through a, a very specific list of these communities um, to look for opportunities. We haven't been able to find any great tools for it, honestly. Um, what's really worked for us is just getting in the habit, scheduling time, and then making room for it um, in our busy days to actually take on the work of right. doing these individual reach outs. Can you think of some examples of some other companies that have used user-generated content really well to build credibility? Yeah. Um, one of our... Uh, biggest markets in the user-generated content space was um, hospitality. Uh, when it comes to travel, people are always looking for, you know, trip advisor reviews or actual photos from a specific location uh, to make decisions on where to stay and, and what experiences to buy. And one of those um, companies that we worked with, uh, their hotel chain, um, but they really went all in on the user generated content strategy and um, didn't use the Instagram photos just for the website um, or just for TV screens in their hotels, but they actually printed out uh, tweets and testimonials from uh, guests onto key cards, you know, so that when you're sliding the key card in, there'd be like a little story about, you know, a little Instagram photo of somebody's experience at that hotel and what they liked most about it. And there's nothing that is as authentic as a tweet these days. And it's just um, even more surprising and delightful to see that in something as boring as a hotel key card. Yeah, so, that's a great yeah. example. I have not seen that before. So what other stories or, or secrets or strategies could you share with us about credibility marketing, about from influencer marketing to um, reviews marketing to success stories, testimonials, you know, word of mouth marketing. What else have you seen done really well by, by businesses in that credibility marketing space? Yeah, I think one key thing, just to pull it back to the content side where I do have a little more experience, um, companies that I've seen really succeed in building credibility are companies that are really able to identify what their audience is looking to learn more about. Um, so one of our customers uh, is a uh, popular um, credit card aggregator. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention them on this podcast, but if you've searched for a credit card, you know who they are. <laughs> and uh, what they do is they build content around comparing credit cards and which ones are the best for travel, which ones are the best for points. And what they do really well is answer um, exactly the questions people have about credit cards. Um, and they do that by having a very intensive research process baked into every one of the pages that they create, uh, where they um, do a lot of uh, research to figure out what questions people are typing into Google around very specific credit cards, um, where it gets really granular, you know, where uh, how much is a Chase point worth compared to an American Airlines point, and, you know, what are the very specific details about these programs? Um, people. Like if you're a if you're a content marketer who's not familiar with this niche, you wouldn't know that you should be answering these questions. But they do a really good job of answering them, and I think that that leads to credibility and trust, um, not only with the search audience but also with Google, and that is really what's allowing them to rank high in the search results because. When users trust the content, when users interact with it and stay on that page and click around, 
Google's constantly measuring that and using that to figure out who is rank, uh, who should rank at the top. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That strategy of finding the most commonly asked questions and answering those questions on your pages is is a very valuable strategy. I remember probably eight years ago, nine years ago, we kind of did this by accident. We didn't realize this was a great strategy. And, and we were helping one of our, we're helping a, a customer to, to build a new website. It was a website that was not showing up anywhere in search results. And we found like the 200 most common questions in their niche. And we answered those questions. And within a 12 month period of time, that, that company, that website was, uh, number two or number three in Google for the their primary keyword, which was a very, uh, very highly competitive, you know, single word keyword. So yes, I know that strategy works exceptionally well. Definitely. And one of the reasons that works so well is you're filling existing demand. You're not creating an article and then trying to find an audience for that article or piece of content. Instead, you are finding where there's an existing demand, what people are already searching for. You're writing the article to exactly match that article and, and you're filling an existing demand. And just by definition, you're going to get a lot more traffic for that. Definitely. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that anybody who's starting content marketing uh, thinks that they have to overcome is that they need to stare at a blank page and put everything that's in their head onto it. And then everything, you know, follows from there, but it's really, diving deep into your audience's head, figuring out what they want, and then catering to that, figuring out yeah. what their passions and interests are and what is driving them. Um, what are the best tools that our audience could use to find the, the best questions that people are already asking in Google for their niche? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think one of the uh, most useful places to look, which is completely free, is Google search results themselves. Those people also ask boxes that show you what questions people are asking that are related to that search term. If you click into those, it'll give you more questions. So you can actually click into those and expand them and close them and, and get all the questions related to a given keyword. Um, and that's generally the best practice when you're doing a content creation for search. Um, one thing that we've built to make that easier, we do have a free tool. Um, and if you search for people also ask on Google, it should show up at the very top, but it's basically a, a free tool that does that for you. Um, so you give it a keyword and it'll give you all the questions. I love and, that. Yeah. Okay, audience, that is extreme value right there. That is a key takeaway you need to write down and implement. Go to Google, type people also ask, find his free tool. What's the URL of that tool? Uh, it's usedtopic.com slash people also ask. Okay. Yeah. And use that to find the most commonly asked questions related to your niche. And then set your content team live creating articles about those. If you're already creating an article on a certain topic, go do that search first and find out what angle you should take in the article and what title you should give that article so that it coincides with those most commonly asked questions. Absolutely. I think one uh, other tip is that it can be useful not just for articles, but for podcasts too. So that when you repurpose uh -huh. a podcast content and turn it into a blog post, then you're answering all of the questions that the search audience is interested in just through doing the interview. And so that is a great idea. And honestly, yeah. I'm embarrassed that I have not done that yet for my shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a new thing. Uh, that we're trying to get more people to do, but we've seen a lot of success with our, our podcasting clients who, who use our tool for that purpose. Yeah. 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 It's interesting because podcasts really aren't showing up very well in search results at this point. There's really not a, a great way to get traffic from Google at this point to promote your podcasts, but it seems inevitable that it's got to go that direction. Just like Google has been implementing, you know, they implemented uh, blog posts in their, in search results. That didn't used to be the case, or they've, they've implemented YouTube videos in their search results, right? It seems inevitable that at some point in the near future, they will also implement podcast episodes um, predominantly in their search results. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think Google is moving towards a model where they show 
lots of different types of search results covering different perspectives instead of mm -hmm. just the same articles that are rehashing the same information. And so I think podcasts are a great source of getting different perspectives. Um, I think one of the biggest gaps right now for businesses is that oftentimes they'll turn their podcast um, and take the transcript and just throw it on up there and hope for the best. But really, you know, if you're a search, if you're a searcher looking for a solution and you click on a link and, it, and it's just a, tr uh, you know, a transcript, it's hard to read through that and turn that into an answer to your question. So um, I think there is an opportunity there for uh, businesses to spend a little bit more time making those transcripts parsable, adding even more content so that it is uh, more of a resource for a search audience um, and taking basically a lot, um, putting in the extra effort in order to turn that into a viable, um, searchable piece of content. So how would you organize a team to most effectively produce content? So I think one thing that most people get wrong is that they either think that, uh, they think, they think that people have both the analytical mindset and the creative mindset to produce content, but really those things often are two contradictory ways of thinking. There needs to be an expert who is more on the analytical side doing the research and then somebody else who is able to turn that analysis into something that is entertaining and consumable. And so if I was putting together a team from scratch, one key thing that I would do is hire separately for those roles and make sure that it's not just one person in charge of both because you really need those two separate pieces in order to produce um, content that's that's comprehensive and high quality. And those may be two different skill sets, maybe a much more creative person, maybe a much more analytical person. Absolutely. What is the best story from your career? About uh, four or five years ago, when we were still at that previous company, we had uh, different tiers for pricing. But many, many years ago, we had abandoned our free pricing, but we had grandfathered lots and lots of users into our free uh, pricing tier. So we had this baggage of users who were using our product for free, and we were trying to find ways to monetize them. You know, how do we, how do we uh, turn this into an opportunity? You know, they're using our product for free. I'm sure they'd be happy to, you know, work with us or do something, or we could take advantage of them somehow to um, grow our revenue. Uh, we floated the idea of doing something like ads, you know, showing ads within the product. Um, so just to give you some context, the product was an embeddable product, a social media aggregator that you could put on your site. So people could put an Instagram widget on their site or a Twitter widget on their site. And so maybe we could show ads in there, or maybe we could uh, charge for being able to moderate the content. So we had all of these different ideas. And during the brainstorming session, uh, an engineer proposed, oh, maybe we can um, use the traffic that they're getting and mine cryptocurrency. You know, and cryptocurrency was a very new and exciting thing at the time. And we were like, okay, um, that seems pretty nice because people who are seeing these widgets won't have to deal with ads. Um, our, cust our free customers won't have to be um, educated about this change that's going to introduce ads. It's going to just run a script in the background and we can monetize them um, by, by mining cryptocurrency. Uh, but I made an enormous error in not realizing uh, what a bad idea that was for multiple reasons. Because, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's not good to mine cryptocurrency using strangers' computers without their consent, um, obviously. Also, Google uh, saw those miners as um, being related to cybercrime and spam uh, because, you know, lots of... Uh, there's criminals who do that kind of thing where they take advantage of a computer and mine cryptocurrency. So they've flagged those, uh, flagged those scripts as being dangerous. And so we turned this on for a small subset of our customers to test it out, to see like whether this would be viable. And we ended up getting our product blacklisted by Google, um, and so anybody who used our product saw, saw a big warning that said, like, this site is using a malicious script. And so oh. 
that was uh, that was a huge fiasco, and I think the biggest uh, learning was that um, one, it wasn't worth it. Uh, but we were able to quick quickly own up to it and clean up our site and clean up everything after that. But in the end, we only ended up making two dollars and seventy cents out of that project. So I'm that was sad. just a very very uh, painful and 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 um, terrible mistake that we made. Well, that comes back to the credibility marketing point we were talking about before. Um, as we are looking at ways to monetize our business, we have to look at the how that source of monetization is going to affect our credibility. And there's a lot of ways we could monetize our site or our business that might hurt our credibility. And we've got to think very, very carefully if we're willing to do that. Um, and we've got to take into account the credibility hit that we might take from any source of monetization. And and I would argue that we probably shouldn't implement any form of monetization that hurts our credibility, right? Think of the old AOL days where you signed up and they charged you and it was just impossible to ever get it turned off, right? Or think about the people that, that put you know, 25 ads all over a page, right? There, there's lots of ways, or, or even people that you go to the website and they turn on video without your permission when you visit the website, you know, you're, you're in your bedroom and your wife's sleeping next to you. And all of a sudden, you know, video starts playing, you know, with, with its audio. And uh, then, you know, there's a lot of ways that a lot of decisions entrepreneurs make related to their monetization that can really hurt their credibility. And we need to make sure we don't do anything. There's no monetization that's worth hurting our credibility. Absolutely. I think that there is a uh, hard to quantify, but enormous dollar value to credibility for a business or a brand. And uh, it's important for everybody within an organization to recognize that, um, even if it's within a product team who might not realize that. It's important yeah. to recognize that. Thank you so much, Rio, for sharing your stories and insights with us today. Here are some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, AI text generation systems are likely going to result in a commodification of basic content, driving down prices and putting more emphasis for marketers on creating content that stands out from the rest of the pack. Number two, user-generated content can be a goldmine we can repurpose for our own marketing channels to increase our credibility. Number three, we can monitor conversations around our brand and keywords and then join those conversations to gain testimonials or solve negative customer experiences. Number four, we can create our content around existing demands and questions our consumers already have to increase our credibility. Number five, to create a great content marketing team, we should hire those who are creative at creating content and we should also create those who are talented with data and analytics. We shouldn't try to hire one person to do both of those different functions. To learn more about or connect with Rio, you can find him on LinkedIn or visit his website at usetopic.com. And there's links to both of those sites in the blog post for this episode at monetizationnation.com. You can also get a free copy of my ebook, Passion Marketing and learn how to become a top priority of your ideal customers at passionmarketing.com. You can also subscribe to Monetization Nation on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, our Facebook group, and on your favorite podcast platform. If you received value from this episode, I would be very grateful if you commented on, liked, and shared it. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I wish you success in your content marketing. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.